Now our next presentation by Dwayne Veron, CEO of Media Science, is another exploration of keeping your target's attention by countering ad avoidance. To do this, Dwayne will discuss a new ad receptivity framework that I think you'll find fascinating. Please welcome Dwayne Veron to the stage. The kernel. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Artie. So uh, in my very short uh, 10 minutes, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey. Um, as you know, st uh, ad avoidance is not new. Uh, audiences have avoided ads uh, you know, probably since the dawn of time. Studying ad avoidance is not new. I think the best ad avoidance study was the research that was done in the 1950s, where people analyzed the water pressure that was coming out of the plant and discovered that the audience actually, that water pressure went up because lots of people were flushing their toilets during the commercial breaks. So a behavioral measure of what the audience was doing, fantastic way of measuring it. But one of the things that I think that has been particularly problematic is that we have growing trends with audiences' capabilities around avoiding ads, but the dialogue around how to measure and how to understand ad avoidance really, I think, has not progressed at the same pace of the audience activity. So we need some new tools, and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk to you about a large body of research that we've done over the past 16 years, over 50,000 test sessions that we've been doing, looking at all the different ways, using a lot of the new methods, facial coding, uh, eye tracking, and uh, biometrics, to try to understand that. Now, the challenge that I have is that's a lot of research to present in 10 minutes. But what I hope to do is leave you with a single thought. And that thought is that we are giving a lot of attention to ad creative factors. We're giving a lot of attention to the viewer, and we're looking at this relationship without sufficient attention to all the environmental factors. And the reason I think this is a very important idea for us to understand is many of those environmental factors are things we can heavily influence. So if we want to counter ad avoidance, we have to elevate our discourse to understand deeper the environmental factors that influence the ad, the environmental factors that influence the viewer, so that we can come up with strategies to respond to those needs. Now, that's the one idea, and I'm going to tell a story now which kind of sets up that, that idea. So we're calling this the ad receptivity framework. Uh, a number of years ago, I had the opportunity to speak from this stage, and it was on that occasion that I made this plea to the ARF to engage in what became the Neurostandards Research Initiatives. Today I say, just as there's a lot of attention to ad viewability, I believe strongly that now we have a need for understanding ad receptivity. I think the construct ad receptivity is more important now than ever because the audience's capacity to attend and engage with our messages will increasingly depend upon their willingness to open their minds as our, our messages communicate it with them. So the ad receptivity framework starts by saying, OK, we can study an ad and understand creative factors. As uh, you know, the work of Stuart and First, I think, in particular, really pioneered in terms of moving us forward. So uh, we run the ESPN lab in Austin, Texas. We do tons of work looking at factors, for example, in our promos. So if we put time and day above the game, so Thursday, 7.30, Knicks versus Celtics, how does that differ to putting it below the game? Knicks versus Celtics, Thursday, 7.30. So when the time and day is above, the eye tracking technology shows us it's seen on average by 16% of viewers. If it's below the game, it's seen on average by 73% of viewers. After the fact, that makes sense. The eye is attracted first to the game, Knicks versus Celtics, and then you read down from there. So it makes all the sense in the world, but that research is critical to understanding the effect of those variables. We have a lot of work in the world around the individual traits. How do young people differ from older people? How are men different from women in terms of ad receptivity? But increasingly, we need to put much more attention to the environmental factors that moderate and affect the creative, 
and to the environmental factors that moderate and affect how the individual experiences the ad. And this is one of the problems that I have with the entire concept of programmatic buying. Because programmatic buying is unidimensional. Because you are failing to appreciate just how significant these environmental factors are in moderating the effect of the ads. And that's actually where the research community really adds value to the entire marketing equation. So let's now talk about some of the creative factors. So the most important is program. How does a program moderate the environment in which the ad is actually seen? Now there's been a lot of research on this. For example, we've done work looking at states of viewing. So we demonstrate how people are very different when they're watching in a relaxed mode. They're very different when they're watching in a reluctant mode, as often happens with co-viewing, where maybe you're not like your spouse in terms of the program that you're watching. And we found that the most powerful state of viewing for a program, because we find that genre is a very poor predictor of program effects. And the reason genre is so poor is because genre as a construct is inherently too broad. It means too many different things. And we find that excited viewing is really good. But here's the funny thing. What is the optimal position in the ad break? It turns out it's not the A position. It's the C position. And the reason it's the C position is because whatever caused that excitement overwhelmed the first two ad exposures, and the optimal position turned out to be the third ad in the break. Just an example. Um, pod architecture, how does the structure, a long break versus a shorter break, uh, historical effects like uh, frequency, uh, platform effects, what are the differences across devices, looking at format effects, what are the different ad models and how do they moderate the effect, and other factors. And for the viewer, how do they have the ability to control the device? Um, what is their disposition? We've done a lot of work on brand integrations, demonstrating how the integration fundamentally frames how they then experience the subsequent ad exposure, and things like product category, et cetera. Uh, the viewing state, I talked briefly about that. What's their motivation for watching television? What are the nature of the distractions that are present? What are the social influences that moderate their effects and others? And again, there is not time to devote to looking at this all. But I want to just give you a sample of some of these. Now with personality traits, we did some really interesting work testing a whole range of psychological uh, personality traits and looking to see how they were affecting uh, ad impact, uh, uh, sorry, ad avoidance. And in particular, we thought, if, for example, ad avoidance is about locus of control, then if we know that, we can then figure out how to design ads that can counter that for people who have that particular personality trait. What we discovered, which shocked us, was that personality traits are not hugely influential with ad avoidance. Things like the ad creative, the frequency, those are much stronger factors driving ad avoidance than personality traits. So we believe that much more attention really needs to shift to a lot of those environmental factors. Um, so with an example of program transfer effects, now there's been many, many, many studies that have been done over the past 50 years on how program transfer effects work. I would argue one of the main flaws with that body of research is that the research generally is measuring specific ads. So the typical design is, here is the same ad seen across different programs and look at the effect. But test a different ad and you get a different set of effects. And that's the problem with the body of research. Because we're not measuring at the right point in time. We're measuring after the ad exposure. But there were a lot of moving parts in the ad. And th that interaction actually resulted in a lot of the effects. So we argued the proper way to do this is to test prior to the ad exposure. So between the program and the ad, a complicated idea, especially in 10 minutes, but this was a study that we did for NBC News, and what we did is, instead of showing people ads, they would watch a program segment and then go into a psychological test. So you would watch the program, and then you would do like the Stroop test. So the Stroop test is where you see a color, but it's written in a different color. So you see the word red, 
but it actually appears in blue. And you have to specify what color that is. So you have to use your rational thinking skills to answer that. And what we demonstrated in that study was that when people watch news, the engine is rolling for their cognitive processing, and as a result, they go into the ad break with better access to their cognitive resources. So a really good example, again, of measuring a program transfer effect uh, at the point of, uh, so, so I have a lot of these. I won't have time. I was hoping to go through five, but we won't really have uh, an opportunity to do that. What I would encourage you to do, if you're interested in this topic, we do have a booth, uh, Media Science, in the corner. Drop off your card. I'm happy to explore coming out and giving you guys a workshop where we can explore the topic more comprehensively. Thank you very much. Thank you.